Hello everyone, this is segment 4 in the Environments Historical Geology chapter. Uh, we are at the river systems as depositional environments and the last segment, in the last segment I stopped at the meandering streams. So let's talk about them. Uh, remember the meandering river channel has very typical curves which are meandering back and forth on the relatively flat uh, floodplains. So here I just drew the meandering stream. And, and these curves uh, most likely have formed because wherever the river can flow just a little bit faster, it would actually erode the stream. So these bands are going to form where erosion is happening. And on the other side, that position will happen. We call the eroding part cut bank. That's the cut bank, and this is the point bar. Remember, we learned about it in physical point bar. And the, as I just mentioned, the travel goes faster on this side and slower on this side. That's why you have that position here and erosion on the other side. Um, if you look at the cross section of this channel, like I'm going to, put the cross section right here. This is going to be A and this will be B. The A side is the cut bank, so this is how it's going to be. The cut bank side is going to be much steeper and this is where the water uh, is going to be um, faster. And this is when it moves slower. Um, so this is where you have erosion and this is where you have deposition. Um, in, the, in the channel, you have mostly coarse to medium sandstone and because the meandering part of the streams usually are closer to the beach so this sand mostly will have quartz in it. Um, around the channel you have really wide flood plains and uh, the flood plains plain sediment is mostly siltstone and clay so it's going to be siltstone mudstone on the flood plains and uh, coarse medium grade sand in the channel. This slide shows a, a very good picture of meandering stream. Remember, we also learned that as the, as the meanders are going to be steeper and steeper, sometimes they will cut off, making the so-called oxbow. So this is a typical oxbow right here, oxbow lake, oxbow. It's just A-X-B-O, O-X-B-O, I should say. And if you look at this area, there is another one right here. So... And the, and the channel is moving back and forth on its own flat, flat plane. And this slide here shows you the cut bank and the point bar. So you can see that those are those areas. Um, we are now at the very last uh, type of river, which is uh, at the same time a, a different environment also, the so-called transitional, because it's in between the ocean and the and the terrestrial environment. And it's important to understand that uh, the delta itself actually is influenced by the ocean because as the water is trying to move in to the ocean, it meets up with the waves. Remember, the waves are coming back and forth. So basically, as the river trying to enter the ocean, it stops because the ocean is coming against it. So what happens with all the sediment when the stream is actually really slowing down or actually stops. Yes, you're right. The sediment has to deposit. Now, the sediment deposits, so therefore it makes the channel actually to split. I don't know how to show it with this camera. So the, the channel is going to have to split because all this sediment settles down. So you're going to have a delta shape, typical split uh, rivulets, I should say, like this because all the sediment being deposited in between. So you're going to have this delta shape. Uh, which other stream does it uh, look like? It basically looks like the alluvial fan, and it's very similar, except the sediment is mostly like medium to very fine-grained sand as it enters, with a lot of silt and, and uh, clay, actually. But the main thing is that it's a very typical delta shape, and that's why we call them delta. Uh, and actually the delta can move back and forth of this huge big delta plane. So the stream is actually not 
uh, permanently in one area, but it's moving back and forth on the delta plane, on this whole big area. As you can see on this slide, uh, the Mississippi's delta actually moved the whole lot during the, the uh, times it has been going into the uh, Mississippi, into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and it has deposited a whole lot of sediment. Now, deltas are very important because in the channel, you got medium to, to fine grain sandstone, and in between the channels, you got silt to clay. So, therefore, as the delta is growing through time, you're going to have channel deposits, which are closed because they are surrounded by silt and shale. So they are going to be extremely good uh, oil reservoirs. You know, reservoir is a type of rock which can store and transport uh, liquid, which could be water and oil. So we're talking right now about oil because that's why delta X sequences are so important. So it's very important for, for geologists to find ancient delta X sequences. And... Um, there is this slide to show the development of the delta. Just think about as the Mississippi Ocean is entering into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, it's actually building toward the deeper water. And the way it happens, it has three parts, delta plain, the uh, delta front, and the pro-delta right here. So the delta plain again, the delta front, and the pro-delta. And as time goes on, it goes more and more toward the ocean. So the delta is building toward the ocean, as you can see. And it's going to be full with these channels surrounded by mud and clay. So therefore, they're going to be extremely good oil reservoirs. So it's important to find these systems uh, through time. And now we're going to talk about the transitional environment. The transitional environment is basically the zone between the continental environment and the marine environment. So it will include the delta, we just talked about it, the beach, the tidal flats, and the coastal swamps. So let's start with the beach. The beach basically forms because of the longshore current, and we talked about that in historical geology. Remember, the longshore current is because the, setting, the, the waves are coming up with an angle, but, but it, the water can only go back perpendicular uh, to, the, to the shoreline. And so therefore this movement comes in with an angle, comes back straight, comes in with an angle, comes back straight. So that will cause the so-called longshore current. And um, the longshore current uh, brings the sediment. And if you have more sediment along the shoreline, which it can transport, of course, you will have the so-called beach. Uh, usually these uh, sediment on the beach, the sand, which is carried by the longshore current, are well sorted. The sand is well rounded. And um, sometimes it also will have pebbles if the beach is really high energy. Remember, high energy means wavy. This is where you want to surf, where it's really high energy waves you might even have pebbles because it's very, very high energy, so only pebbles can settle down in that area. And um, at the closer part of the land, if the beach is pretty sandy, actually some of the sand will be uh, settled down as sand dunes on the really the continental end of the beach. Uh, so, as I said, these sands on the beach, usually when it's a big continent, are going to be very mature, quartz sand, uh, very well sorted, and the grains are very well rounded. Uh, the, the coarsest the grain size is at the closest to the, to the land, and then it gets it finer, 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 and then, you know, clays in the deep water. And this is just a very nice example of it. The next area is the uh, tidal flat. The tidal flat is the area which is very much influenced by the tide. Actually, most of it is, is underwater during the high tide and uh, no water during the low tide. The area above it is what we call supra-tidal, supra, supra, S-U-P-R-A, supra-tidal. This area only underwater this area only underwater during hurricanes or something. 
super tidal. That's a very interesting area. That's where you got the sand dunes, the little crabs running around. I, I bet you have seen it before. So it's 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 this whole tidal flat area is very very interesting. If you ever wanna go and see all the creatures and everything, and exactly the the parts of this uh, whole area, you have to go to Jackal Island, Georgia. That's the coolest place. Jackal. very historical and beautiful you can bike uh, it's it's a really amazing place so you should really really go I go every Thanksgiving that it's really fun okay the last transitional environment is the coastal swamp the coastal swamp is an area which is basically closed off from the ocean by usually a sand um, like a sand dune kind of uh, deposit and so therefore you have this um, area which if if the climate is humid which is full with water but then it's also going to be grown over by plants like on this picture actually we have two possibilities one when it's mid latitude or mid latitude when it's mid latitude you have pine trees and that kind of uh vegetation when you're in the tropics you're gonna have the mangrove which is very typical this is the coastal mangrove swamp Ma Mangrove. M A N G R O V E. Mangrove. Uh, that's a very typical uh, tropical environmental plant. So you will see them on the beach growing on the carbonate mud. Uh, and for this, it's, it's very good. Uh, uh, Everglades is a very good example uh, for this one. Sorry. And for the mid-latitude is Virginia Beach. If you go to the Virginia Beach State Park, uh, you will see it. It's exactly like this one right here. So it's a good place to go and see while you're taking this class so you learn how the coastal swamp looks like. And, and you can see the water is going to be almost black. And um, it smells funky. You can see that the organics cannot decay there. So um, coal is forming as we speak. So this takes us to the coal formation. And as I just told you, the coal usually forms in the coastal swamp area. And uh, as it gets covered by other sediment, it gradually will become coal. And this is the process which we call coalification. During coalification, um, there will be a lot of decay uh, no, there will be a lot of changes like bacterial decay. So the the gradually the material, the original plant material will become coal. The first step is the peat. When you got peat, you still see all the plant um, remnants like the roots, the other parts of the plants also, but mostly the roots because these are like underground. Um, of course, a lot of times you can see the trunks and everything else. As soon as you burn the peat, it already can give you heat, but when you burn it, there is like 35% uh, uh, ash which remains, so that's how much part of this peat is not carbon yet. Uh, the next step is the lignite. The lignite has 75% carbon and 25% ash. And then you got the bituminous coal, which is 85% carbon and 15% um, uh, ash when you burn it. And uh, if the coal metamorphoses, we call it anthracite, and actually the anthracite is 95% carbon and uh, only 5% of it is ash. So all you need to have all these um, better coals is just time and burial. So it has to get deeper and there has to be a lot of time going by. And now we are at the marine environment, but I guess I'm going to make another segment. Uh, so I'm going to stop right here with the fourth segment. And that is the fifth is going to be the very last one. So I'll see you in a minute. Bye.